All right, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about indefinite integrals. And so to talk about indefinite integrals, we have to start by talking about what is an antiderivative. And so take a look at this function here. We have f of x equals 4x cubed. Let's say we wanted to find a function whose derivative is this function, 4x cubed. Well, we could think about it for a little bit, and maybe eventually you'd come to the idea that we know that the derivative d dx of x to the fourth power is equal to 4x cubed, right? Because if we use the power rule on x to the fourth power, we'd multiply four and then subtract one from our exponent, so we'd have four times x cubed, right? And so this is the derivative of x to the fourth power, which is also our function up here. And so what does that make x to the fourth power? Well, we call x to the fourth power the antiderivative of 4x cubed. It is the opposite of a derivative, right? If 4x cubed is the derivative of x to the fourth power, then x to the fourth power is the antiderivative of 4x cubed. And so we like to denote the antiderivative with a capital F of x, and that will be equal to x to the fourth power. Now watch what happens though if we take the derivative of a function like this. Let's say we have the derivative d dx of x to the fourth power plus five. What is the derivative of that function? Well, we know that the derivative of x to the fourth power is still gonna be four x cubed, so that will be four x cubed. And then let's take the derivative of five, which is a constant, so that means the derivative of five is zero. And so we'd just be left with 4x cubed again. All right, well, let's try another derivative. How about we take the derivative d dx of x to the fourth power minus 12? What would that derivative be? Well, once again, we'd be taking the derivative of x to the fourth power, which would be 4x cubed. And then we'd be taking the derivative of negative 12, which is a constant. And so that would also be zero. And so this derivative is also just equal to 4x cubed. And so we could continue to do this for more and more constants that we could be adding to x to the fourth power, but we would still keep getting this derivative of 4x cubed. And so what we find is that there is an infinite amount of functions that are going to have this derivative. We could keep adding different constants, whether it be 100 or a million or 150,562. We could add any constant to x to the fourth power or subtract any constant from it and still have the derivative 4x cubed. And so what we like to do when writing the antiderivative is representing that constant that could be added or subtracted with this plus c. And this is going to represent all those different values that could be part of this function such that this function would still have the derivative 4x cubed. And so this is the antiderivative of 4x cubed, x to the fourth power plus c. And so we call this process of finding the antiderivative anti-differentiation or indefinite integration. And so that's where the idea of indefinite integrals comes from. And so let's say that you know that you have a function that is the derivative of another function, right? You have some function f of x that you know is the derivative of some other function. Well, if we multiply dx to both sides of the equation, we'll have that dy is equal to f of x dx. And then if we perform this indefinite integration, then we'd have that y the original function that is the antiderivative would be equal to this integral sign of f of x dx. And then of course that would be equal to your antiderivative plus c. But this is the important step right here. This is the definition of an indefinite integral. And so let's take a closer look at this definition and let's identify all the different parts so that you really can understand what an indefinite integral is. So here we have the definition of an indefinite integral. We have the integral of some function times dx is equal to the antiderivative plus c. And so this is known as the integral sign. And then the part inside our integral is known as the integrand. And then this dx here, you could call it the differential of x, but I think it's more useful to think about it as an indicator of the variable of integration, right? This means that we are finding the antiderivative or finding the indefinite integral with respect to x. So kind of like how we took the derivative of a function with respect to x or respect to y, we have a way to indicate what variable is being integrated. And so we'll say that this represents the variable of integration. And then this is our antiderivative. And then of course this C, which we talked about earlier, is called the constant 
of integration. Okay, and so these are all the different parts of an indefinite integral. And so now we're ready to look at the basic rules of integration. So just like we had rules for differentiation and finding the derivatives of functions, we also have rules for integration that make finding antiderivatives a lot easier. All right, so here's our first rule for integration. We have that the integral of some constant k dx is equal to k times x plus c. And so for example, let's say we had the integral of 8 dx, that would be equal to 8 times x plus c, right? So whatever your constant is, right, 8 is just a constant, it's not being multiplied by any variable in this case, it's just 8 dx, the integral is going to be that constant multiplied by the variable that you are integrating with respect to, right? So we're integrating with respect to x because this is dx, and so we're going to have 8 times x and then plus c. And so then next we have the power rule for integration, which is one of the most important rules you're going to learn. And so we have that the integral of x to the power of n dx is equal to x to the power of n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus c, right? So whatever your exponent is, you're going to add 1 and then divide by that new exponent, right? We had n, now we have n plus 1, so then we divided our term by n plus 1. And so then it's important to note this rule does not work if n is equal to negative 1. So if you have the function 1 over x, you cannot use this rule for that function, right? This would be equal to x to the negative first power, right? So if n is equal to negative 1, like it is in this case, you cannot use this rule. And that's because in the denominator of your answer, you have n plus 1. So you'd have negative 1 plus 1, which is equal to 0. So you'd be dividing by 0, which is an undefined value. So that's why it doesn't work. In order to integrate this function or functions like this, you're going to need a different rule that we will learn at a later time in calculus. And so for now, do not worry about when n is equal to negative 1. You're not going to see any problems that have this exponent of negative 1 when you're first learning integration. So don't worry about that for now. But to see an example of using this rule, let's take the integral of x squared dx. What would that be equal to, right? So what we'll do is we'll take this x squared and we'll add one to the exponent. So we'll have x to the power of two plus one, and then we're gonna divide that by the power of two plus one. And then we don't wanna to forget to add plus c, and then we can simplify, and this will be equal to x to the third power divided by three plus c. Right, we added two plus one to get three, and two plus one in the denominator to get three as well. And so this would be the answer to the integral of x squared dx. We just have x cubed divided by three plus c. And so before we look at our next rule, if you're ever not sure if the answer you get is correct, remember that what you find is the antiderivative of the function in your integral, meaning the function you find should have a derivative that is the function in your integral, right? So if we were to take the derivative of this function here that we got, right, if we had d dx of x cubed divided by three plus c, we could find this by using our power rule for derivatives for this term. So we'll multiply three down and subtract one from the exponent. So we'll have three x squared divided by three, and then the derivative of c, a constant, would be zero, so we'd have plus zero, but we don't need to write that. And then these threes will cancel out, and we're just left with that this is equal to x squared. And so we just found that the derivative of that function we found is x squared, which is the function we integrated. And so if you're ever not sure if your answer is correct, you just have to take the derivative of it and see if you get what you started with. Let's look at some more integration rules. So here's our next rule. We have that the integral of some constant k multiplied by some function dx is equal to that constant k multiplied by the integral of that function dx. And so essentially what's going on here is that if we have the integral of let's say four times x squared dx, this would be equal to pulling that four out to the outside of the integral. So we'd have four times the integral of x squared dx right? That is what this is saying. We are able to pull out a constant from our function inside the integral to the outside of the integral. And so then we would be able to multiply this by the answer to this integral. And so remember, we just found that the integral of x squared dx was x cubed divided by three. So this would be equal to four times x to the third power divided by three plus c. And so if we simplify this, this would be equal to four times x cubed divided by three 
plus C. And so here's the important part. Notice that I didn't multiply this 4 by this C, right? We just have plus C here. Typically, we do not change the constant of integration because it doesn't matter what you multiply it by. This function that you have, its derivative is still going to be what's in your original integral, right? So the answer doesn't change if you multiply this C by that value of 4. It's still going to represent any constant, and so it's a bit unnecessary to multiply it by any other value. And so this would be the final answer to your integral. Next, we have these two rules that kind of go hand in hand together. They're very similar, but they're also very important. And so let's start by looking at our first one here. We have that the integral of some function f of x plus some other function g of x and then dx is equal to the integral of that first function, f of x, plus the integral of that second function, g of x. And so an example of this would be if we had the integral of x squared plus 8 dx, that would be equal to the integral of x squared dx plus the integral of 8 dx. Right, and so we already found the answer to each of these integrals earlier on, and we found that the integral of x squared was equal to x cubed divided by 3 plus c, and then we found that the answer to this integral, 8 dx, was equal to 8x plus c. And so now this is the only time you're gonna see me do this. You notice that we have two c's here. You don't need to do that. You don't need to have two values of c when you are adding two indefinite integrals together. This is a bit redundant. You only need one plus c, and so we'll actually get rid of this one here, and our final answer is just going to be x cubed divided by three plus eight x plus c. And so when you go through the process of solving an integral like this one where you have multiple terms, don't worry about having multiple c's. In fact, don't even write them out just write one C at the end of the integration of your terms. And so this would be the answer to that integral. And then for our other rule, we have that the integral of some function f of x minus another function g of x dx is equal to the integral of that first function f of x minus the integral of that second function g of x. And so an example of this would be if we had the integral of x squared minus eight instead of plus eight like we did up here, and if we found the integral of that, this would be equal to the integral of x squared dx minus the integral of 8 dx. And so once again, we know the integral of each of these functions. We've already did it a couple times. And so this will be equal to x cubed divided by 3. And remember, I'm not going to write multiple c's, so I'm going to wait until the end, until I finish this integral to write our c. And so then we're going to have minus 8x plus c. And so now technically you would have parentheses here, right? We are subtracting this entire integral. But once again, just like with our earlier rule, we didn't multiply 4 by our constant c because it's kind of unnecessary. And so the same applies here. You don't need to make your c negative. So you're not going to have this term minus 8x minus c because c still represents any constant and this function would still have the derivative of what is inside your integral. And so we don't actually need those parentheses and our c will stay positive and this will be the answer to that integral. All right, and so the big takeaway here is that if you have an integral of multiple terms added or subtracted together, you can just integrate each term and add or subtract them together. So from here on out, you don't need to write these intermediate steps. This is kind of unnecessary. Hopefully you can see that this will be equal to the integral of this function right here, plus the integral of this function right here. We can skip this step now that you've seen how these rules work. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. All right, so before we move on to our final rules for integration, I want to show you some techniques that you're going to want to know how to use when going through some of these basic integrals. So let's start with this one. We have 1 over x squared dx. And so how would we go about finding the answer to this integral? Well, what we want to do is we want to rewrite this in a way that we know how to integrate. And so we know how to use the power rule for integration. And so if we rewrite this integral to look like this, we'll have the integral of x to the negative second power dx, now we have a function that we recognize and can use the power rule to find the antiderivative of it, right? So all we did was move this term in the denominator to the numerator by giving it a negative exponent of negative two. And so now we can go through our power rule and we can say that this will be equal to x to the power of negative two plus one divided by negative two plus one. And then we'll add our value of c. And so this would be equal to x to the negative first power divided by negative one plus c. And then if we move this to the denominator, so we'd have a positive exponent, we'll have that this is equal to negative one divided by x plus c. 
and that would be the answer to this integral. And so then how about this integral? How about the integral of the square root of x dx? How do we go about this one? Well, just like we rewrote the function in our last example, we can do the same thing here. We know that the square root of x is the same as x to the 1 half power. And so we can rewrite it in that way. And so now we can see how to integrate this by using the power rule. And so this will be equal to x to the 1 half power plus 1 divided by 1 half plus 1. And then we'll add c. And that will be equal to x to the 3 halves power divided by 3 halves plus c. And so then if we multiply the top and the bottom by the reciprocal of this denominator, then we'll have that this is equal to 2 thirds x to the 3 halves power plus c. And that would be the answer to that integral. All right, and so that's how you can rewrite functions to be able to find their antiderivatives where it might seem difficult to do otherwise. All right, so before we end this lesson, we still need to talk about the trigonometric integration rules. And you'll find that these are going to be the exact opposite of your derivative rules for your trig functions, right? The derivative of sine x was cosine x. And so it only makes sense that the integral of cosine x would be equal to sine x plus c. And then the integral of sine x is equal to negative cosine x plus c. And the integral of secant squared x is equal to tangent x, right? Remember that the derivative of tangent x was secant squared x. And then we add that the integral of secant x tangent x is equal to secant x. And then the integral of cosecant squared x is equal to negative cotangent x. And the integral of cosecant x cotangent x is equal to negative cosecant x. And then of course, don't remember to add c to the end of each of those functions. And so these are your basic trigonometric integration rules. Again, they're just the opposite of the derivative rules for those functions. And so let's look at two quick examples before we end this lesson. All right, so here we have the integral of seven cosine x dx. And so the first step that we can take is we can move this seven to the outside, right? That's one of the rules we know. We can write that this will be equal to seven times the integral of cosine x dx. And then we know that the integral of cosine x is equal to sine x. And so this will be equal to seven sine x plus c, right? Since the derivative of sine x is cosine x, that means that the integral of cosine x will be sine x. And so that is the answer to that integral. And then for our second example, we have the integral of negative four cosecant squared x dx. And that's going to be equal to negative four times the integral of cosecant squared x dx. And so then we know that the integral of cosecant squared x is going to be equal to negative cotangent x by using our rules that we just looked at. And so then this will be equal to negative four times negative cotangent x plus c. And so that means that this will be equal to positive four times cotangent x plus c. And that will be the answer to that integral. And so it's going to be beneficial for you to learn those integration rules for trig functions. They shouldn't be too hard to learn if you already know the derivative rules because it's just the reverse, but you're still going to want to take a good look at them, especially at the ones that deal with some negative signs like cosecant squared x does. All right, and so that's all I had for this lesson on indefinite integrals. If you want to see some more examples of solving indefinite integrals, feel free to check out our examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I have for now. So I will see you next time.